Thank you, and uh, welcome, and welcome to Sean. Before we start, I wanted to say that um, this is the eve of a melancholy anniversary in New York, and I just want to mention that in 9-11, uh, a terrible thing happened. Some of you, I'm sure, were in New York City on that day and witnessed the horror of it, and you came back from this purgatory, this limbo of destruction and the death of almost 3,000 people. So it's a credit to New York and to you that you're here, you're stronger than ever, and New York is actually more vibrant and more lively and more vital than it's ever been. So you should give yourself a round of applause for having come through that. Uh, Taj, in his introduction, went across the, uh, the, um, the main points of, uh, of Sean's career. And the, uh, the conventional thing is that Sean needs no introduction. Actually, I think he does need an introduction. You think you know him, but you don't know him. Um, Marlon Brando once said, an actor is a guy who, if you ain't talking about him, ain't listening. <laughs> and Penn is a listener. He's an activist, a writer, a man in motion. He's not only written a lot of screenplays and, uh, and uh, uh, serious pieces, but op-eds and in-depth pieces, the most recent of which is, uh, was about El Chapo, which we could talk about, I suppose, or not, but they're always related to mayhem, to crisis, and uh, his commitment to disaster relief, in particular in Haiti. He's a great traveler. He's traveled in Iran, I Iraq, Pakistan, Bolivia, Mexico. He's been many places that I have not been, and I envy him for it. Um, personally, we have a lot in common. You wouldn't think so, but we do. Uh, we're both noted for our sunny disposition. <laughs> we're neighbors in Hawaii. I was his stunt double in a couple of movies <laughs> and his body double um, in a couple of very steamy um, sex scenes. Um, <laughs> I was his life coach. I remember in Palm Springs, you remember last spring when you had your car, had this terrific car. I said, Sean, you got this great car. You can get checks with this car. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you know, I hadn't thought of that, but I, I can. <laughs> and then another time in Hawaii, I, I said, I sometimes have the feeling that Lenny Kravitz is having more fun than me. And he said, I know Lenny Kravitz. I was on a yacht with him, and he's not having more fun than you. <laughs> So anyway, um, we're here to actually to talk about um, uh, uh, Bob Honey uh, uh, singing Jimmy Crack Corn. But before we do, I just want to ask him, but j just say one, to clear up one misconception about El Chapo. Th you, you said to Charlie Rose that uh, one of your key motives was to, um, to bring attention to the fact that we are drug a drug culture, and we're stimulating drug sales. Can you just say something about uh, um, your relation to the Mexican drug trafficking and to uh, El, the, the El Chapo piece? Just that, you know, I had spent in enough years as one more citizen in this country watching our focus be on <clears throat> attacking the supply side and uh, punishing the demand side and not reconciling the demand side in our own country. And so my interest in it, um, I, mean, I, I had initially invited him to join me at Camp David, but I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> low hanging fruit. Um, <laughs> um, but I, you know, went down there with, there was no exercise in my brain to make a kind of moral judgment on he as an individual, as a drug lord. It was 
really to, to, to use what had been made the poster child of this horror, violence, and addiction, um, and to, to starting a you know, um, continuing or reflashing the conversation about this. And um, it has been a con a clearly a failed war on drugs, a failed just say no campaign, a barbaric prosecution of people, uh, and, a, a, and kind of just a, a good economy for those in the prison business. And um, that, was the, that was my interest. You know, um, I've spent the past two years, almost two and a half years, going back and forth in Mexico. And I've rarely read, I don't even think I have ever read, an account as hair-raising as your account of actually going to find El Chapo. The, the flights, the rides, the, no blindfolds, but it was, I, I mean, it seemed to me like 12 hours of, um, of just going down one, one road, then another road, then meeting other people. It was actually amazing, just getting there seems to me an amazing thing. And I would say, by the way, I would do that in a minute. I would do it in a minute. <laughs> I mean, I, not, I the, not the horrible trip, but if someone said, do you want to meet El Chapo, uh, I mean. Yeah, once you make that decision, the adrenaline's running, and it's not until you get back that the rash comes up on your skin. Uh, it, 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 it is, li listen, there is um, thrill involved in that, um, which is not to minimize uh, the pain, the suffering, the loss that so many people have had at the hands of this war. And yes, I understand they could say it relative to him, um, but it is this story that affects, there's zero um, degrees of separation in an American family from uh, drug tragedies now. And at some point, the results matter. And so we have to say, well, why, you know, we can't keep repeating the same um, um, uh, 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 remedy when the remedy is making things worse. I want to ask you about um, when I saw you um, late last year, you were making a, a, a planning a documentary about Jamal Khashoggi. What happened to that? T tell me what led up to it and uh, uh, did it go anywhere? Yeah, well. You know who Jamal Khashoggi is? Yeah. yeah. Well, I had gone in, uh, let's see, I had made a couple of trips into Syria, the last couple, uh, 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 the last one being during the, what was the final bombing of, Damas uh, toward, uh, 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 of Damascus, which happened five years after the Arab Spring, only two, three years ago was the last time there was a major assault on Damascus. And had gotten um, the one side of the story I wanted to tell, which is about the Arab Spring, the quote unquote Arab Spring, and that I had remembered all the pundits and even heads of state, spokespeople for the State Department of our own country, everyone anticipating that Assad would fall within months of the beginning of the Arab Spring. And it was a kind of five years later, why is he still there documentary. And I'd gone in with a friend from Beirut, and we were able to meet with Assad, uh, who was for that part of the storytelling willing to let us do the only, for me the criteria would be that we'd be able to move without minders, um, talk to people, on, anyone we wanted to, and that he would make available those who had been journalists for what was an opposition n news that had been five years dead because, you, you know, kind of a martial law and the sort of emergency state of it, and all, uh, um, imprisoned ISIS soldiers, every, all of this. But that would be one side, and, I, and he agreed that he understood that we would come in illegally later through Turkey to meet, you know, focused with the United States military and intelligence organizations and get into various NGOs working there. And we were going to try to do a kind of global answer to this question as a documentary. Very quickly after that, whether it was he or his, the people that surrounded him, uh, you know, one thing after another was being um, taken away from the freedoms that we would have to tell the story. And I guess kind of was kicking the dirt and said, you know, the hell with it. And then 
but through the network of people that we had met and journalists, some extraordinary journalists that we met that were willing to participate in that original idea of a documentary, um, when Jamal Khashoggi was murdered by the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, which is what happened, um, uh, we, did, we wanted to do a story about that and we had um, great contacts in Turkey and we went and it was when I met his widow I thought this is the whole story to me and it was as though I had been in love with the wife of my imagination of that documentary and then met her and said no this is what I'm in love with this story she's an extraordinary woman and she had made a commitment to meet with two potential documentary filmmakers. We represented one group um, and a formidable documentarian. I didn't know who was also in Turkey. She had to meet with also, and she was new to this whole thing and very much wanted to honor her, you know, to be betrothed um, partner's memory uh, in how this might be done. And he, the other documentarian was already very financed and was somebody I thought was great. And so my interest was in telling the story and I thought, well, the heck with it, we'll just uh, let him do it. And I had things to do here and that's what happened with that. Sorry to take such a long time to answer that question. No, no, that's, uh, that, that, that's an aspect of, of what you're doing, the, uh, the seriousness of, um, of your filmmaking, the idea that you that had that to do um, Khashoggi. The other thing that I, I was going to say that um, you think you know, but you don't know him. Uh, Sean is a, is a very devoted father, is a wonderful family, and was recently, tell us what you were doing in Winnipeg over the summer with uh, your, your oh, kids. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I got to, I got to, so anybody here has seen The Ferryman on Broadway? So that great writer, Jez Butterworth, wrote a screenplay about 12 years ago that I'd, I was going to do as an actor with Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu, and then that, some things happened with that, didn't happen, and, and then it came back around to me to direct, and um, it, it's, a, it's a woman's story, a true story, um, written by a woman named Jennifer Vogel about her relationship with her father, who was a uh, a criminal and through his multiple abandonments through that part of his life and his um, um, unfamiliarity with honesty uh, <laughs> were the, the kind of travails, she, the, the things that she had to get through to become this extraordinary woman who wrote this memoir about her life. And I just uh, got to direct it starring my daughter as Jennifer Vogel, my daughter Dylan and uh, her brother Hopper, who's sitting right there, uh, playing her brother. And um, last minute, the actor who was going to play their father in it uh, had to back out for personal reasons, and so then I um, had to step in, and, and, and I got to act with my kids, uh, playing their father, and, and watching <laughs> their amazing talents uh, with Jez Butterworth's amazing script and a great cast around it. Seems like a dream to me to make, to, um, make a film with your children, you're, you're there, you're, and you're the father in the movie, and when will it come out? I, uh, a year from now, maybe, yeah. I've got to finish this book tour and then go and edit. <laughs> okay, we're here to also to discuss um, uh, Bob Honey Sings J Jimmy Crack Corn, the sequel to the earlier book, Bob Honey, He Just Do Stuff. Um, some of you, most of you, I s assume, read the first book, Bob Honey, he just do stuff. I doubt that. I don't think that's true. I think most of you have read it, and what I'm here to, to suggest is you can't really read the second book unless you've read the first. You can read if you want, <laughs> but you'll understand it better. Um, the reviews and some of the questions um, seem to me that you've been, I heard you on the radio this morning, and I've seen some reviews and so forth. No one seems to get this book. But I'm telling you something, I get it, and a lot of people who um, have read American satire will get it. Um, we all know who Nathaniel West is. He wrote The Day of the Locusts and Miss Lonely Hearts. You know who I mean? Okay. 
He wrote two other books. Are you, are you familiar with his two other books? Um, one is called The Dream Life of Balzo Snell. Have anyone read it? One hand went up here in the front row. <laughs> And it's Alex Birnbaum. Second book is called A Cool Million. Any readers of that? Alex Birnbaum did not put up her hand. OK, A Cool Million. OK, this is the Bob Honey of 1938. A Cool Million is a quotation. Uh, it's an American saying, John D. Rockefeller would give a cool million to have a stomach like yours. It's um, a satire of uh, Horatio Alger. But the Bob Honey is Lemuel Pitkin. If you read that, anyone who's read, Nathaniel West, by the way, was a screenwriter. You know that? And he died in 1941. And he was 40 when he, when he died. And Bob Honey resonated. Have, <laughs> have you read A Cool Million? No, I saw the movie of A Day of the Day of the Locust. Okay, Day of Locust, great. But you've channeled, I'm telling you, either through Hollywood or, uh, or through um, being an American in this period. Um, a cool million, in a way, uh, anticipates Donald Trump. There's a character in it called Shagpoke Whipple. Shagpoke Whipple is Donald Trump. He becomes president. He becomes president of the United States. And um, I found that, uh, uh, that Bob Honey was kind of an extension of that. What I'm, I guess, asking the, the first question is related to the first book. He, he do st stuff. What, what impelled you to turn aside from writing scripts, because Sean has written numerous scripts, to imagine this character who, it seems to me, is your age, um, has aspects of your childhood, childhood high school or school buddies and so forth, and has done the, what was the impetus that made you turn aside from acting, script writing, and doing an activism to sit down and do something you had never done before? I'm going to say that I had a clear thought that I wanted to write a novel at about age nine. Um, and, and I um, procrastinated. Um, and then 2015 came along. And that, what was going on um, in terms of uh, the presidential race? And all that was beginning to be, I don't want to say unearthed, because certainly any of us that were paying attention, even subliminally, now recognize that we saw it happening our entire lives. And I can't speak from, you know, firsthand witness from before 1960. But I can then come to this place where if I had joined in a culture, and, and here's what I have, a little tangent. I realize that, and this has always been true, whether I was doing, um, you know, publicizing a movie that I believed in, forget about something I didn't, or for whatever reason, is, is to, to be in a room of more than four of my good friends is socially uncomfortable for me. And I always have a person, a little person here that's accusing me of hucksterism. Um, and then there's you, <laughs> who I'm, I have great comfort watching your fascinating mind move at a thousand miles an hour in the trade winds of Hawaii on a hill. But then coming here and like in, in this kind of situation, this is something I'm reviewing all the time as I move forward with, with this, talking about these books. And, tr and, and wanting to share it with people and wanting people to read it and knowing about the kind of inherent prejudices that they'll be from whatever the perception is of me or, or the luxury I've had of being able to do what most first-time novelists can't do, which is to be able to you know, get on TV and talk about a book or 
you know, it's kind of a, you know, a really enviable position, and I, and I recognize that. And at the same time, I, so in answering, you know, there's a kind of a, a, a moment where you're, you find one, yourself talking, you know, here's, we're in New York City, and it, it's Paul friggin' through, you know, who I, you know, I remember, I, when I first met him, so I remembered exactly the dimensions of the room I was in when I read Mosquito Coast. And so, yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, but Enough about me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't promise. No, no, but, 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 it's a, yeah. but d so the, the decision the to write yeah, a... Uh, is, to it was not a decision. If I had to make this a decision, I would have procrastinated further. It was... I, I was talking last night about this. There was this great interview with Paul Newman l later in his life where he was asked, what was the secret of the, su his, the success of his relationship with Joanne Woodward all those years and so on? And I remember the beginning of his answer where he said, as it turns out, we loved each other. And I just f like sort of fell in love with that guy, uh, with that, there's that, because that is so much about how we get to the good things in life is not something under our control, but kind of as it turns out, this part of me made sense. And now I'm going to sadly not be Paul Newman. As it turns out, I felt that I had let my li the, the times I lived in, 1960 to now, or to 2015, really imprison a part of me. And there was nothing in me that could survive it without this was writing this book was like the the key to getting to breaking out of that friggin prison and it was and and it was laughter it was being able to in a, in a time where I was becoming you know I it, it, I am not unaware of my reputation for self seriousness um, <laughs> um, you know, it was, which is only true relative to social discomfort anyway. You know, everything's a sort of mask. You realize it as you get older. Because I have, I'm the silliest guy in the room with everybody else I know. Um, and finally I had to write my silly ass novel that I love. And it was, became what, I, what I'm now calling kind of um, the literature of the ludicrous, the age of the ludicrous. And, and it's ludicrous alliteration, ludicrous language. And, and I am not wrong that things are ludicrous right now. Um, Do, but I was going to say, sort of what you're saying is it's not a choice. It becomes something inevitable. You procrastinate until you get to a point where there's really nothing else to do. Maybe, I was thinking, maybe it's a great thing that Donald Trump is president and that it forces all of us to declare our position. What are we going to do about him? What are we going to do about... What are we going to do ourselves? At the same time, when you started writing this, I thought, you know, when this, you're talking about the, the onset of this, this guy in the White House, I thought, I was working on a novel, and I thought, I can't write this novel. He's, everyone's talking about, he's talking about the border and Mexico. I'm going to Mexico. And so I put everything aside, and I thought, because they're talking about immigrants, the border, and Mexico, I'm going to go to Mexico. So I spent the next two years, you spent the next two years writing your novel as a response, like a visceral response to this guy. Um, and I went to Mexico. I mean, because it, 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 I thought, it's not even a choice. I'm going to do it. You don't screw it. I'm not going to put this. The novel seemed, uh, it can wait. But Mexico couldn't wait. In your re response, what you call ludicrous, you've got to think of another word for that. But it's sort of, it's like an anti-novel and like, and like an anti-hero, but it's a response. Each of us has to think, what are we going to do about this? It's like a big test of our imagination, our conviction, our will. And, you know, with all due respect, the Democrats haven't really come up with an answer as, as vital and as, as imaginative as Bob Honey. That Bob Honey, in a way, is the answer to, to, to Trump. Do you, <coughs> do you know what I mean? Well, I, I do, I don't want everything in Bob Honey to be a trip. I mean, it's up to you, it's up to you 
to do something about him. Do you know what I mean? That I know what you, anyway, go on. Well, I was gonna say that I don't want everything about him to be attributable to me. But everything about him does represent, in its heart, an aspiration. And it's an aspiration to having a pure thought, to having one's own thoughts, to having an uncommon thought on a common matter. And so, you know, I think that, you know, one of the things I'm, I think about a lot, because I have a 26 and a 28 year old, science tells us that it's game over. Basically, it's game over, that you can do all you want. You can get a Tesla, you can do whatever you want, but the climate's gone, we are going to be degenerative matter shortly. But we don't know how the molecules of the world are going to kind of regenerate themselves and, and, and morph into things that, that, that maybe human thoughts can influence in the airwaves. Or There's all kinds of, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's kind of an, the, you operate on science and not on the smoke and mirrors of, of, of um, mysticism and religion that, uh, in, that, you know, responsible for more murders than Manson. And you, 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 you kind of say, well, look, I know what I, I know. I, even if it's all over, I can try. And so you try, figure out how you can try better every day and laugh a little more every day. Donald Trump, whether or not he, you know, it's, it's such an easy thing to uh, loathe. But, but hard to get, yeah, easy but, to loathe, but he's there. He's in the White House. I mean, he's got the nuclear yeah, code. Yeah, and he's us. Yeah. He's, he is what we have fertilized of a celebrity culture. And, 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 there, and nobody is without complicity in that. And this is, so I wanted to write a character whose immunity to all the things I let, you know, we all let ourselves get conned by, or the sides that we get very self-righteous on and all of this stuff. Uh, you know, I kind of, I finally felt like, why am I trying so hard to defend an idea when every idea is defensible? If you can't defend an idea, you just have a lack of an imagination. Uh, because no idea's got an answer, and we're not here for answers, and it's about questions, but I've got a guy named Bob Honey who's not looking for answers. He doesn't have any questions. <laughs> He's just clear. And so, in the first book, we're introduced to a guy who very clearly recognizes that the elderly do not contribute their share to the global economy, and their flatulence diminishes the ozone, and therefore, <laughs> they have to be dispatched by mallet. And so he is a, an assassin working for a, a non-disclosed government organization doing that. And so it was about declaring a moral code that made me giggle in the den off my kitchen when I wrote. I, I was going to say, that, so th this is related to uh, the idea in the book that branding overcomes being. Is it, uh, uh, if I got that right, it's branding? Bra 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 yeah, bra branding is being. Branding uh, is in being. In this culture. And in a way, uh, 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 Trump is a triumph of branding too, isn't he? But this old, you know, the, uh, when, you, when I read the thing about the old people, the satire bopping on the head, I was thinking, what is, uh, what is uh, the reason for older people in the United States being ignored? One of the great things about going to Mexico. See, Bob would have said, what is the reason for older people? What is the reason for old people? <laughs> because because he's, he's saying that marketing is, uh, uh, marketing is directed to the young, mm -hmm. to the, uh, the 18 to 34s. The marketing is, a, what, what do old people buy? Depends. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, so because so you go to a place, using Mexico as an example, where I'm Don Pablo, I'm um, a, 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 a hombre de juicio, I'm a man of judgment. I, people, you know, younger people give me their seat. Older people, they just get out of the way, you old guy. You're not an old gringo in, in Mexico. You're respected. But older. So when Bob Honey is bopping these people on the head, I'm thinking, in a way, that's related to. You could say the capitalist idea of what are old people good for? They're good for nothing, really. You know, I mean, what, what, we have no status. Yes, it's I'm merciful just, dispatch. Huh? Yeah, it's a merciful dispatch. Merciful, yeah, yeah. bopping on the head. But, you, but, what, but you've hit on an idea uh, 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 that 
that in America, the old are disregarded. We don't, we don't matter. I mean, forget old white guy, just older people are, are despised. They have no, because branding or marketing kind of consigns them to the, to the, uh, the category of what are you gonna buy? You're not gonna buy anything. What are you good for? What are you good for? You're just, as Bob thinks. So I think that in terms of satire, you've, you, you've really hit on something that, I, that, that no one else is talking about. Well, I think it, it really, I mean, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna take a chance on a thought that I haven't thought out and say, I don't know anybody, any of us that feel that we were at our most productive anywhere after the age of 19 or before the age of 49. I think there's, you know, we have an inspired, you know, immortality um, that, that happens as young people. And there is the wisdom of, of, of the, the older, where I'll be in a year or two. I'm a year away from 60, so I count myself as older after that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it, there's, the, you know, in the everything in between category, I look at the people that inspire me today, and, and, and with exceptions, of course. And <clears throat> it, it, you know, it's like those kids in Parkland who forget about, forget about everything else. And I've talked about this before. Anybody that's ever, heard a long barrel automatic weapon in an open space knows how scary the, the report of that crack is, how violent it is. But the idea that it's in the concrete walls of a school and it's your schoolmates intestines on the ground and on the next day some of those kids could face those cameras with such articulation and such composure and such truth and courage. There's no way to not have hope about yeah. where things can go. But if the hope is invested in whether or not Donald Trump wins the next election, then he will win the next election. Yeah. That's where the hope's invested. Yeah. I think that, you know, it, it's, it's about the, the, the uncommon thought on the common matter is, the, is, is mostly related to this word that triggers all of us, hope. If we think of it conventionally, we will fucking murder our children. The, the, in the end, we've got we've to unveil that, that peel, and, and, and this is what it is about the Bob Honey character. This, this, he's immune to all of the noise and is mightily flawed but it's kind of again goes back to this aspiration of being in a place where we don't let our egos outweigh our draw our, our, our the drive we're born to have it's like christopher hitchens we used to talk about you know you're, you're born ill and commanded to be well with christianity or any of that um and I don't even know what question I'm answering at this stage. No, no, we're talking about it in general. No, all right. But, but uh, can I just say that that, that um, that's what editors are for. No, but but, but Bo I thank you. But Bo Bob Honey is able to do more things in your book than he could do in a movie. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the 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 advantages of writing a uh, a, a novel rather than writing a a, a movie script? Because Obviously, there's no, you, you can write a, 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 a novel, you can write fiction with no inhibition at all. It doesn't, it's not gonna, um, you, you, you're not budgeting a movie, right? Yeah, no, the stroke of a pen gives you $20 million more on a movie script. You, you're, you do a scene description that calls for, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if the idea is to let yourself dream and share that dream and hope that, you know, a percentage, not everybody, you wouldn't, you're doing something wrong if everybody connects with it. But if a percentage enough, it makes it worth your time and theirs to share what you write or what you make as a movie maker. And sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't, but you, that's your, what you're trying to do. You know when you're, when you're um, Paul backstage said he didn't want to have a beer because he'd burp. I just burped for you and I didn't have a beer. Um, <laughs> 
but I've got what I call my mother's coffee. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but, 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 uh, but so, talk about that, how, how, so, liber yeah, how liberating yeah. it is to... Well, it's, it, it's just, if I want to write, there are, you know, 20,000 soldiers and six of them are on unicycles standing on their head against a perfect sunset. I, I, I don't, I, it's not going to cost me a lot of money to write that in a novel. If I want to actually, like David Lean used to, somebody asked David Lean, why does it take you so long to make a movie? He says, because I actually want to shoot what I wrote. Yeah. And nowadays, because there aren't too many uh, film people running the, what we'd call the studios, the studios are amalgams of various things now, um, that are movie people, that were people who fell in love with that girl we call cinema. They're, they're number crunchers or they're whatever, and they might be wonderful people, I don't know. I, I, my experience is that they're mostly not. Um, <laughs> but they, they don't know damn, they don't know shit about movies, and, and, and they don't really care about them. And so writers, directors, actors, and I include myself to varying degrees, we get to a point where we're, we're representing storytelling, we're not telling a story. And, and backing down to the interests of this thing or that thing. And, 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 I, and, to, and, and at this stage in my life, to be able to go into a room and write it as I hear it, like the music in our head. You know, I, I told you before, like, there was a kind of rhythm of speech that I entertained myself with when I first started driving cross country back and forth. I said, just, just do it like you hear it. And, and, the, and the avenue to do that was a novel. And, and, and I don't apologize for that. But I also think that you, you, you're a reader. One of the things, um, it, it, both in, in the first book and second book, um, I made a list of words um, that I didn't know. <laughs> calescent. Do you know what calescent is? Anyone? Calescent means growing in warmth. Uh, punctuated equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Tellurian. Any, any, tellurian? Yeah. Tellurian <laughs> means an inhabitant of the earth. Flux density. Subsumption sub architecture. Trumpery. Um, trumpery. That's a good one. Trumpery. Trumpery is a real word. No, no. Trumpery is a real word. It means to deceive. <laughs> trumpery. <laughs> trumpery. And by the way, imagine, not that anyone we know did, a family whose name was Drumpf, as in Mein Drumpf. Um, uh, as in Mein Drumpf, no? Okay. <laughs> uh, changed their name to Trump with the word trumpery, meaning to deceive. Uh, and there's one, co <laughs> another one. There's a character called Anasirma. Anasirma, A-N-A-S-Y-R-M-A. -A -A. Ring a bell? Anasirma. It means mooning. It's a Greek word for mooning. Or, or the, the goddess of exhibitionism. Yes, yes, sorry. The goddess of mooning. Mooning, yeah. Well, actually, there is a, there's a statue of Anasirma with lovely shaped buttocks. Baby got back <laughs> sta uh, statue. Uh, <laughs> but, but, do you see the picture? I okay. seen that. Um, you know, well, they're going to ask us some questions in a little while, but do you want, do you want to read the, the, the Giuliani one or the, or the In Memoriam? Should I? Let me no, Yeah, there are a, a couple. So what happens in these things that we're doing tonight is, you know, sometimes I'll do a little reading, sometimes not. In this case, because it was one of my literary heroes and, um, and, and a lucky me friend. Um, I, I said to the, the organizers of this or the people working with me, well, what pieces would Paul pick? And um, as he made clear, and I have to thank uh, Tyson and Guy, uh, a rare bird uh, of my, my publishers and editor, uh, that they allowed me to, to do a direct continuation of the first book but the books are pretty short. They're a little dense. I'd like to think by dense, I mean a lot of stuff put together tightly. <laughs> um, but it is 
true that you're kind of wasting your time reading the second if you haven't read the first. Um, so I'm going to just randomly, before I do that, I, I found really short pieces because uh, Paul gave me good starting places. Well, the only long, this is only, let's see, this is a, it's too long. Uh, I, I'm going to, maybe I'll, you'll let me know if I should go back to one uh, because I, I worry that might be too long. Um, so. Do you want to read 116? Yeah, let me see what 116 is here. Thanks. Okay. Oh, you're talking 116, the first one or the second? Sorry. S second. Excuse me, yeah, pause. Sorry, one, one, <laughs> one, what, one, so 118, 19. Oh. Yeah, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, see if you recognize anybody in this. This is a real short paragraph. This is in, uh, yeah, this is in the, the current book, the one that came out today. Well into the evening, an aberrant acolyte ricochets rumors off satellites rhapsodically. The hyperthyroid darting and de descendants of his eyes spell lies, lies, lies. A regular of the 24-hour menstrual cycle we've become inured to and call news. This one-time New York mayor and lawyer of merit has managed to morph into a maxi pad. <laughs> as he absorbs the ever-flowing dark blood of his Don's deeds. He is among the litany of the lost who run rampant and raise ratings in their purchase of podiums. Anyway, that's for him. <laughs> you know who'd like that? Judith Nathan. <laughs> Sex. Huh? Judith Nathan. Oh, right. is, yeah. Oh, is that his ex-wife? Yeah. Oh, d you, know, you know, somehow they're going to have a, a, a halo for her getting through it. <laughs> okay. Do you want to read one more? What, 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 read the in memoriam thing. All right. That's, um, let me see. 157. Oh, wait, because I got one before that <laughs> that you picked. So I'm going to do it, then I'll go to that. Okay. Are you up for it? You being polite? <laughs> okay. How many are being polite? <laughs> well, fuck you, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> okay, so this is just a little Bob moment, and, and I, I, I didn't reread it, but I noticed what it was, and Paul had kind of put it on his list of things he thought might be readable, so I assume you'll be all right. Um, Bob's temptation to move toward euphoric reattachment, a calculated caution to be most carefully considered. He'd been born to see a generation of optimism drowned by neoliberalism, liberalism, long hair and needles drooping from punctured veins. He'd seen California Quaker and Harvard Kraut murder 20,000 additional American boys in the treasonous power play of a political campaign. Oh, Henry. Somebody got it. <laughs> He's about 90-something. You know anybody named Henry in that? It was a murderer named Henry. Uh, uh, these significant signs of his time and his own travels through acid storms had shown him the only gangrenous dormant derma of human disposition. And those few aspiring angels who had listed LSD their license to soar in surrendering to chemical conceits had they leapt from tall buildings in a dream to fly and instead die. Armed with his cachet of reservation, Bob reverts to the backup systems of skill sets set to satisfy the justifications of antisocial behavior. Critical field operators are often accused of subjectivism. Bob perceives this as a scrutiny by a sissy society, and with rectitude, his situational awareness would part terrestrial penumbra to prevail. He'd breathe in, then out, hold breath, repeat. In resolve, he opted to believe. He'd give the gang another go. Their faces, now finely cut to discernibility by the fire they'd sown, display themselves to Bob as charred and buzzing forms for the purpose they were born. These who, in their core, were born as horseflies fit for war. That's it. Somebody coughed. Who are you? <laughs> 
Should I know you're ambivalent. Okay, so we'll go to the last piece. Last bit, yeah. So this is, uh, should I go to the in memoriam? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So this is, this is how the, um, the second book ends. This is the... This is a spoiler. This is the farewell. This is the, f huh? No, but, it, it, well, you can leave if you're that, <laughs> if you're that interested and you're actually going to read it, go, but, you know, I mean, it, yeah, if you can see Hamlet a lot of times and like it again. <laughs> you won't remember this, just enjoy it. So there is a narrator within both books. There's a, a person who our main character meets who's actually the person who is writing his story but then um, betrays it. And, um, and there's something about uh, betraying the story we ourselves write that uh, our country's becoming too familiar with. <clears throat> uh, In Memoriam by P.P., who is this character, Pepe Pariah, who is the, the, the writer of Bob's story. <clears throat> they say it's always a woman who brings a man down, but not so for Bob, and neither was it Bob that got the best of me. This is Pappy talking. Neither was it Bob that got the best of me. That besting was the bulwark of a bald girl who most often goes blonde. A girl in whom Bob had found an absence of disturbance and a glistening between her legs. These could have been the clues this minister missed. I don't know if it's been the wine, the women, the sun, or cigarettes, but damn if I haven't grown older. I suspect Bob is now singing his own psalms somewhere under, under palms, but it's time for this man from Kentucky to pass on his portfolio and return to the high hills, mountain leaves, and tappity tap of the pilloted pecker plundering pulp with pride from in its plumage. When they can better a man like me, you know no lie is safe. And truth ain't worth the lion dreams of flying. You see, this is what happens when a novel's narrator sells out its own character. Imagine if a nation did the same. Bob Honey prefers the tropics. 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 Good. And, and, the, and the theme song to that is, I'm older now, but still running against the wind. <laughs> running against the wind. Okay, quick answers up here. Yeah, ready. For 200. <laughs> What novelist do you most admire? Paul Thoreau. <laughs> and anybody else? Herman Melville? Let me, um, Alejo Carpentier, there's a great book, uh, The Lost Steps. It's also dense, but it's also long, and you won't have the excuse that, to, to cop out because he was an actor. He wasn't an actor. Um, yeah, he's a, a novelist. Hunter? S. Hunter? S. Thompson? Thanks. <laughs> Are there any other genres you want to explore as a novelist? Would you ever write an autobiography? Uh, I will absolutely not do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm down with you there. I wouldn't write an autobiography. You know why? Because when you write an autobiography, bi autobiography it, it, goes, it gets reviewed and people say, Eh, not much of a life. I'll give us your life a C minus. No, not much of a life. You present your life, and they say, "What a shitty little life you've led." <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give to young people who aspire to be actors or writers? Well, forget writers. But what what advice would you give to young people who aspire to be actors? Oh, it's from Dan, a teacher. Uh, I didn't I give. Yeah. Steve asked the previous one. Yeah, the, the conceit in me, large or small though it may be, um, would have liked the question, you know, what advice for you to the young people? I have an answer that I feel very genuinely about, but it would sound like a cliche, so I'm glad to have it be the one about actors. I think, I think it's kind of like being a novelist. It's kinda, you, you, you do it if you have to do it. 
And also, you gotta fi we gotta always think about like what is what is what does that mean being an actor? It doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to trade in the art of celebrity. It doesn't mean you gotta be in movies. Uh, right now, I don't know. I don't have uh, an objective view on what the voice of an actor means in, in with so much content and all of this. Maybe it's more. Maybe it's less. Maybe it's just something different than what I understand because I my concept is being alone in a movie theater with strangers looking at a big screen and being in something that you could you know remember together for generations and it seems very hard to do if that's what's important it was what was important to me for its time if that's what's important that's not coming back or the the, the amount of content uh, certainly democratizes the access to pe for people being able, able to do it but I, I, I don't mind uh, confessing that I am of a time. My time uh, is, you know, uh, the, the girl I fell in love with was the cinema uh, where you could be 10 minutes into a film like, I don't know, uh, Lenny, Coming Home, something, a Terrence Malick film. Um, and, and, and know that for the next, the rest of your life, you could run into people of your time and, and they had the same experience you did and, and they remember it. There are great movies I've seen in the last 10 years I can't remember the title of because I, 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 it's not that there aren't great things being done. But I'm a bad person to ask about this because my orientation is just not, I'm, or, or, or my retention is, is, as I describe, a teacup at the bottom of a waterfall. And I, I need to be reminded of, of the title of things that are pieces of magic. And I need to bang out of my head the titles that are banged into my head um, by can the I marketing. Can I say, uh, uh, just sorry to interrupt, but when, you, when, when you're writing a novel, this novel, or you're in a movie, you can't be the viewer of that movie. You've, you've, you've made the movie, the movie's been cut and edited, you can't see that movie in the way that someone sitting in a dark theater sees it. You have no idea, you have no idea at all of how powerful an emotion it, it, it one feels when seeing a movie for the first time, the whole thing, without any of the cutting room floor, without any of the, you know, the sausage making in it. Same with a book. We can't be our own readers. So you write a book, you spend two years or three years or whatever it is writing a book, we can't I read this book, I was thrilled to read it. I was thrilled, I laughed. But, but I'm reading this in a totally different way from your writing it. We can't be our own readers. You have no idea of how powerful your performances are. Say Milk, for example, or Dead Man, uh, 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 Dead Man Walking, um, uh, or I Am Sam. You have no idea of how powerful an experience that is when you see it for the first time. Just those two hours. And those, you understand it, or the, and the, the reader too. Do you know what I mean? That if only I could be my own reader, if only you could yeah. be your own reader. Yeah, and that's the thing, and it's a lesson I think, you know, that I hope isn't being lost for people who do anything creative, is that, you know, while part of the process it seems to me is that we have to first satisfy ourselves in the sense of what it is we want to share, it's, it's not really a, a form that's given to the, its rewards. It's, it's meant to be a giving thing. And yes, you can be rewarded for it and all of that, but it's kind of a, a bit of a mind fuck to maintain that thing. Again, I go back to like young people, whether it be politically or creatively, there's that moment because we were all young once, and we remember to varying degrees of success or failure, honoring our inspiration in, in that time. And it, it, was, it was really, I think, I like to think that when we go back, it was because some part of us knew that we were not alone, and that if we said it with enough commitment, it would be heard and shared. Yeah. And I, I worry that that's getting more and more lost and part of that because of technology, which is also part of what this, these books, in Bob's case, rail against. 
Um, I, I, I like Bob's railing. I like his. Last question, Bob Honey. Um, will we like? Will we see Bob Honey on the screen? So I have. Uh, you know, I, after dogging religion, I will tell you my religion on this. Part of what liberated me to, to feel great about writing this thing and what will continue to liberate me about writing novels, because I'm going to keep doing it despite the critics, uh, is just a kind of uh, protocol I set with myself, which is if a, if, a, if, if, a, if a filmmaker I trusted wanted to do this and I could maintain um, my, uh, you know, relatively humble lifestyle uh, for a year or two just based on what they paid me to own it, uh, then I'd only want to pay one more time and go see it. I, I don't want to have any part in the making of it. I just like to be the objective viewer and yeah. see what they did with it. But I, I, I won't make it, but I, I, yeah, I hope somebody does. I, I don't know if they will, but I hope so. Sean, thanks a lot. And um, our theme song is, we're older now, but still running against the wind. Thank right. you. Thanks very much. <laughs>